So thank you uh, to those of you at CETA for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Ian, for that kind introduction. And it, it's been fun spending time with you and your colleagues today in various meetings. What I wanted to just share about 15-ish minutes of thinking about is the emerging localization opportunity that is coming up in economic development and some of the lessons that we have from the United States on this. But one place where I'd like to begin is with this woman, Anne Markison. Anne Markison wrote one of the best books evaluating the familiar practice of economic development known as corporate attraction. And she brought together 20 scholars who contributed essays to this volume. It's called Reigning in Global Capital. And what she concludes at the front of the book is that incentive competition is on the rise. It is costly, generally inefficient, and often ineffective for winning regions. Now, it's clearly ineffective for losing regions, but the one thing I would disagree with is the word often, because in terms of cost effectiveness, we know there are cheaper, more cost effective ways of doing economic development. This picture here is from many of the protests that Amazon encountered when it invited cities across the United States to bid to host two of their headquarters. The bids were basically in the region of about $400,000, $600,000 per job. And in the end, they didn't build one of the headquarters in New York because of public opposition. And the other one that they started to build in Virginia, they cut back on once the United States economy went into a bit of an inflationary tailspin. There have been more than 20 studies about corporate attractions that show that this policy is not working. And the reason it doesn't work are, are manifold. Uh, communities get overpromised the numbers of jobs that they are going to receive. There is an unfair playing field between corporations and communities where corporations play communities against one another. The money that needs to be tendered to these companies often gets perceived as a bribe and can uh, create problems for democracy, especially when the deal is transacted in secret. Most of the jobs that are created are actually imported, something around 85, 90%. These policies are largely ineffectual because other studies have shown that the company would have moved to the region anyway for good economic reasons, not for the incentive. But when it does happen, it does create inequality and it also tends to punish local businesses who have very loyally been doing business in the community but not the recipient of the subsidies. There is another way of doing economic development. And this picture here, the man in the right, is a fellow named Lou Stein, who was an economic developer in Appalachian, West Virginia. And for many years, Lou Stein was creating jobs, not at a cost of five or $600,000 per job, but at a cost of about $500 to $1,000 a job. What was the magic? How did he create thousands of jobs at $500 per job? Well, part of what he did was to bring together entrepreneurs, help them write their business plans, introduce them to banks. And part of it was just going door to door to existing entrepreneurs and asking them a question that too often the local economic development agency did not ask, namely, how can I help? And a lot of this really goes to a different kind of economic development paradigm. And this is really where the thinking about localization has come from. 
those of us who have been promoting localization really are embracing three rules for local prosperity. Number one, maximize the percentage of jobs in locally owned business. Number two, maximize the local diversity of your economy, make it more self-reliant. And to be sure, this idea is a little bit in tension with traditional ideas of comparative advantage, but we can talk about how to balance those two ideas. And then number three, create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I don't have time to systematically go into all of the arguments for this, but just to pinpoint a couple of the highlights. This is a study that was published in the Harvard Business Review in the summer of 2010. The title says, more small firms means more jobs. And it's a re regression analysis of communities across the United States and shows that in those communities with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita job growth rate. But not just that, this study from the Federal Reserve in 2013, which looked at counties across the United States, found that in those counties with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita income growth rate. So in other words, if you wanna reduce poverty and raise social equality, locally owned businesses are your best ticket for doing so. We also know that locally owned businesses are connected to sustainability. For the reasons we just discussed, localization is a wealth building strategy. And with that wealth, you have the ability to clean up environmental messes and engage in more environmental restoration. We know that local supply lines, say in farm to table setups, bring down more often than not carbon footprints. There's also studies from the US Environmental Protection Agency looking at smokestack industries that shows that in those smokestack industries that are locally owned, they are producing about one-tenth the pollution of their counterparts that are absentee owned. And probably the best explanation of this is shame. That is, if a local owner bumps into an angry community member in church, in the supermarket, they have some kind of blowback, some form of accountability, and that does not occur with an absentee owner. The last point I will make about localism and environmental protection is that localization invites communities to really be at the cutting edge of becoming more self-reliant on their own resources. And every innovation, say, that Adelaide or South uh, Australia accomplishes with, say, hydrogen is something that can be shared with the rest of the world to help make the rest of the world more self-reliant on renewables. And this brings me to a definition of sustainability. This woman here is Gro Harlem Brundtland. She was the prime minister of Norway, published a study about 30 years ago called Our Common Future. And she defines sustainability as meeting the needs of the current generation without impairing the ability to meet the needs of a future generation. This was a great definition of sustainability, but it was missing one thing place. Place is important. And the way that I would redefine sustainability with place front and center is on the left. Sustainability comes when a community meets its own needs present and future without compromising the ability of other communities to meet their needs present and future. And this, if you take this injunction seriously, then you also are going to embrace the ideas of circularity because circularity is one strategy for creating greater self-reliance. And circularity is everything from minimizing the use of local natural resources. It's also trying to increase the productivity of firms that do use those natural resources. It's also about reuse and recycling. 
And living within our environmental means is if every city in the world did this, a lot of environmental problems, either they would be solved or the, the ability to solve them would be much easier. Right. There is a consensus that is emerging even among globalists that localization is at the cutting edge of where economic development is heading. I encourage people on this call to read this book by Rana Furhar, who is a correspondent with the Financial Times and very much a representative of the, uh, I guess, the finance, finance elite that has been pushing globalization for a generation. And in the book, Homecoming, she basically argues globalization has failed. It has failed because supply lines have been broken. It has failed because of inequality. It has failed because the losers of global trade are now uh, coming to organize themselves in uh, very, very um, undemocratic parties that are upsetting our political status quo. So we really need to rethink our economics around localization. And in her view, as in mine, localization is about local ownership, it is about local self-reliance, and it is about local innovation. How does one implement localization? Well, in my view, there are six Ps of an entrepreneurial ecosystem that can get you there. Uh, by Ps, I mean words that begin with P, planning, people, partners, purse, purchasing, and policy making. Planning means identifying leaks in your economy, all the places where your residents are unnecessarily purchasing outside goods and services, because that outflow of money means a loss of economic activity, a loss of your economic multiplier. People is about supporting a new generation of entrepreneurs and associated uh, workers who are leading these leak plugging businesses. Partners means putting together networks of local businesses that are more competitive as a team than they are on their own. Purse is about harnessing savings locally, either short-term savings in banks or long-term savings in, in superannuation funds and putting those to use in local businesses or projects. Purchasing is about spearheading buy local or local first campaigns. And then policy making is in the domain of the federal, state, or local government, and how do they bring their policies in line with these other ideas. I want to just focus on one of these areas, namely purse, how to harness savings locally, because I think this is an area that can make a tremendous difference in the economic activity that many of you are doing across Australia. This is a picture that I took in the Rose Garden in 2012. It was the first and only time I've been invited to the Rose Garden, but it was because of the signing then by President Obama of what was called the Jobs Act, which legalized investment crowdfunding. Up to that point, it was extremely difficult and expensive for grassroots investors to put even a penny into a locally owned business. The Jobs Act changed that. Implemented in 2016 in the United States, investment crowdfunding has grown spectacularly. The impact of investment crowdfunding has been the creation of about 250,000 jobs. This has come about from about 6,000 companies raising $1.8 billion from about a million and a half local investors around the United States. The average successful crowdfunding company has raised $400,000. The average investor has put into these companies $800. And the most successful entrepreneurs have been women and people of color 
those who have been most methodically excluded from the capital marketplace. It's not enough, though, to just do investment crowdfunding or legal reform. And one of the things that I've been trying to do is develop a list of steps that can help create a local investment ecosystem. If we had more time together, I would remind you that local businesses actually are pretty competitive. Local businesses are the most important job creators in your economy. And local businesses are more profitable than you think, even um, especially if you are focused on existing local businesses rather than startups. But right now in South Australia and in Australia overall, you've got a superannuation system that has about, you know, the total amount of household wealth in your investment system right now is about six and a half trillion dollars. And nearly all of that money is going to publicly traded companies, which are a tiny piece of your economy. It is smarter to think about how we can move chunks of this money into local business. So I want to just give you some highlights, some of the things that are on my list that can be done inexpensively and relatively easily. Unleash Lions. Lions stands for the Local Investment Opportunity Network. It was created by the town of Port Townsend, which is north of Seattle. It has 10,000 people in the town. And basically, it's just a potluck dinner that since 2007 has brought together groups of local investors and local businesses just to establish relationships with one another. That simple social invention has resulted, again, in a 10,000-person town in a million dollars of new local investment per year since 2007. Relationships matter. Also, presenting people in your community with a list of businesses that are raising capital matters as well, too. So a colleague and I created something called the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange, where we list all of the businesses in Baltimore that are engaged in investment crowdfunding as a way of giving Baltimore residents one place they could go to to check out where are their local investment possibilities. And over a period of about two and a half years, mostly during COVID, the companies, we listed 44 companies on the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange that collectively raised three and a half million dollars from 6,000 investors. I'm now trying to do this more systematically in this newsletter that was mentioned in my introduction, the Main Street Journal, which has articles about local investment all around the world. But what we're trying to work on now is adding to each issue of the Main Street Journal, key local investment opportunities that have emerged in the United States that week so that anyone in the country interested in local investment can find them quickly. And I just point out that all three of these things can and should be done by you folks in your own communities, creating lion groups, publishing a list on your website of companies that are looking for local capital, and then circulating the list to interested potential investors. Another thing you might think about doing is facilitating self-direction. So in the United States, I wrote a book called Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, which is all about helping people move their money from their pension funds into local investments. This can be done in Australia as well, through self-managed super funds. This tends to be a rather expensive service right now, provided uh, primarily to richer investors. But I believe that if economic development takes seriously reducing the cost of this, you could open up the spigots to substantially more capital coming into your local businesses and promoting localization. I guess the last point that I'd like to make is that you can't be all things to all people. You can't simultaneously 
attract outside businesses and promote localization. There's just not enough money. And every dollar you put into an outside attraction is a dollar unavailable to nurturing a local business. And every hour you put into that process of attraction is an hour unavailable to supporting a local business or a local business partnership. If you play your cards right, if you focus on localization appropriately, you can expand the amount of capital in your community available for business expansion or business startup by 10 or 100 fold. If we pursue localization wisely, all of these good things can happen.